Hi, I wanna say we have a quick disclaimer at the start of this one. We had a little bit of audio problems, but the interview is still understandable. It's a great interview, so we've decided to go ahead and post it anyway. Thank you so much for understanding. And I do wanna bring this up because I think it's it's really important. And this is something I've observed in all every single person I know who's had ECT and developed issues afterwards. Every single one, same issue is when they report these problems after ECT, they hear the exact same thing. Oh no, ECT can't do that. That's your depression. Depression causes mm -hmm. memory problems. And every, for many, many appointments after ECT, I would try to talk to my doctor. I'm like, no, what did it do to me? I'm like, it, it did something to my brain. I'm not the same. It, it, it did something to me. He deny it, he deny it, deny it. And one point he looked at me and he goes, is your life worth remembering anyway? You know, and oh, here wow. you have this person oh, who my God. struggled with self-esteem, with, with trauma, with, you know, feelings of worthlessness to have your own doctor look at you and tell you and ask you if your life is even worth remembering. And I, like I said, I still, despite a lot of pain, I really still had a rich, beautiful life. Jill, I'm so happy to have you here on the podcast to, to share your story. Jill has an ECT injury and uh, she's kindly agreed to talk to us about you know what happened to her, how it happened, and um, I'm really excited to hear about it. So why, why don't you just t take us to the beginning? How, how did you start taking medications at, at the start? And then tell us the story about how eventually that led to ECT. Yeah, I'm I guess that there always is a story that leads up to it because, you know, very few people don't have a journey with meds first, right? You know, it's pretty rare. Um, I actually, I had a lot of childhood trauma. Um, I was very isolated as a child. Um, as far as very religious family, homeschooled, lived out in the country. We had foster kids. We went to a lot of different churches. What religion um, was it? One of the churches, uh, there were three church leaders who mm -hmm. were um, molesting me and my sister on a regular basis oh, every okay. week. It, they would molest us in the church sanctuary. Um, and so there was just a lot of trauma and I, I get out of childhood kind of lost, you know, didn't really have a voice, didn't have a whole lot of direction. I mean, I knew I wanted an education. I knew um, I didn't want to, get stuck in a marriage, you know, I wanted to be able to support myself. But be beyond that, I didn't really know. I didn't have an identity. I didn't really have, I was just Jill, you know, and I was mm -hmm. kind of starting off my life traumatized, no direction, really no family support. I had been kicked out by my mom right after well, high school. Where were you living? Where did you grow up? Um, in Indiana. Indiana. Kind of and, near Purdue University. Um, and, and what religion, uh, what was the church that you grew up in? Well, we went to a lot of um, non-denominational churches, but they were very fundamentalist and very, you know, um, okay, so like, cr cr like babies, cr Christian you know. spin-off churches. Yeah, yeah kind of extreme fundamental fundamentalist Christian kind of upbringing. Um, okay, and we were basically trained. You know, you don't trust yourself. You don't trust your own conscience, your own mind. You just kind of blindly follow. Um, so I think I really learned how to suppress emotions, you know, kind of putting up with, there were a lot of other things that happened. I was raped multiple times, gang raped once. Um, a lot of bad things happened mm -hmm. in my childhood. And, but, you know, you learn how to cope by sort of internalizing emotions, um, okay. suppressing your emotions just to survive. And so it was just a rough way to start my life. Right. Just yeah, no doubt. Yeah, but late, late teenage years, I think it might've been around the time I was kicked out of the house. I started taking antidepressants through my GP. He was kind of like, after a while, he's like, gosh, you know, you're just getting worse. This really isn't helping. I think we need to transfer you to, mm -hmm. um, uh, psychiatrist. And I, I don't think that actually happened quite yet. But my first real taste kind of of the mental health system of psychiatry was um, my now husband. He was boyfriend at the time. This was after I'd gotten kicked out and I was super overwhelmed. I'm trying, you know, work fast food, pay for tuition, go to classes, you know, working all that. Um, just overwhelmed, just starting life, no family support, nothing, you sure. know, paying for my car. 
uh, I think I was just overwhelmed and I, it's probably a lot of childhood trauma. That I just didn't realize how it was still impacting me. It just, you know, it doesn't click. <laughs> now, one of the things that could be really difficult with childhood trauma is if the parents don't believe what's going on. Did your parents believe you when you told them about what was happening to you and your sisters at the church? Because I know sometimes in these fundamentalist things that that can be really difficult because like the priest or whoever's the head person there is like, it's kind of like God to them. And so that can create these really dangerous rifts in families. I mean, you always, that's always the question. Why didn't you tell? Why didn't you tell? Well, she was actually sitting in the room with us while it happened, supposedly. I guess she didn't know, but. Okay. It, it, uh, you know, it's kind of confusing. I told her maybe a couple of years ago, she just kind of didn't believe me. I tried to bring it up later. She kind of laughed it off. It like it was no big deal and kind of blamed us for it. And, you know, there's really no. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I mean, and you know, we won't go into it because it, it's, it's hard to have the time and I want to focus on your ECT injury, but trauma yeah. like that is very complicated. Trauma like that is pervasive. It really messes with your family relationships and the way you relate to other people. And so yeah, you know, move, moving forward, I mean, you're trying to start your life. I mean, relationships are kind of everything. How do you relate to friends? How do you relate to people in the workplace? So it makes sense that all of these things are really hard and you're doing it on your own, right? Uh, because yeah. maybe you don't, and the maybe thing is, it's hard, I had hard good to kind friend- of trust oh, your family sorry. as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had good friendships. I had this yeah. great relationship with my, my boyfriend. I always yeah. did really well in the workplace. Bosses loved me. Um, but there right. was definitely the trauma was there, you know? Um, and so I'm successful with antidepressants. I'm sort of in crisis. I'm overwhelmed. I'm suicidal. He takes me to, some kind of like psych clinic in the middle of the night, they assess me and, you know, they're like, yeah, you're dangerous to yourself. We've got to, we've got to admit you. And I'm like, well, you know, here I'm working at Arby's. I've got nothing. I've got no money. I'm gonna... I told them, well, I don't have any insurance. And next thing you know, there's this form in my face saying, you know, promises she won't hurt yourself, you know, and boot you out the door. <laughs> so, wow. you know, that had everything to do with liability, nothing to do with helping me, but I'm actually kind of glad it happened that, that way. Cause I would have sort of been in the system even earlier, you know, this is even, all like in your late teenage years still, right? Yeah. 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 I think I was 19 at that time. So, okay. I mean, at the time it was just like, gosh, they don't even want to help me. But again, I'm glad that would have just been that much sooner that I'm like <laughs> in there. Sure. So, yeah, so walk, walk us forward from there. So do you keep on taking medications from 19 onwards? Yeah. So I got married. We got married at 20. It's still just, um, it, it was kind of this weird blend. We had in one sense a really, really rich, beautiful life, but I very much struggled emotionally. So I mean, we had lots of friends, lots of social activities. You know, he was a musician. We were constantly going to his band. I was this groupie, you know, we're going to his gigs and, Life was fun, and um, I was a freelance photographer. I was going to college, excelling in college, um, top of my class, setting setting the the curve at 100% on exams. You know, my classmates were jealous and couldn't stand me because they're like, oh, you said it 100% again, Jill, like, stop, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, just excelling. Um, photography was just a huge part of my life. You know, I was published. I did freelance. I did um, projects with the museum. I, I ran the dark room at the museum. Um, I was in a photo co-op. We just had a very kind of rich, beautiful life. We had our pets. We didn't have kids yet. We didn't have kids for the first 10 years of our marriage, but we had a lot of fun, but I still struggled a lot emotionally, you know, a lot of panic attacks, um, depression, anxiety, you know, the meds were just kind of getting worse. So now probably by now I'm into did, did they give you a diagnosis when they put you on medications? Did they say, Jill, this is for depression or Jill, this is for PTSD? Like, how did no. they explain the reason for putting you on medication? I just got the PTSD diagnosis recently with a new psychiatrist who's helping me wean off my meds because um, he fully acknowledges, yeah, like, this is trauma, you know, like, okay. I never should have been on all these drugs. You know, it took that long. But the funny thing is they do these, you know, 60 or 90 minute assessments. They ask all those questions, right? Yeah, I was traumatized. I was abused. I was, you know, but then they proceed to say, okay, you have this chemical imbalance. You know, they get done. You have this chemical imbalance. You got to be in these meds. So it was, it was depression. And then it became treatment resistant depression, which is what I went into the hospital for, right? Tried all these different antidepressants, different anxiety meds. 
just seem to I'm, be I'm getting worse. And this is controversial. These antidepressants, I, I think, I actually think they're counterproductive for PTSD. I do not think they help people at all. I, I feel like they, if if they help people, it's it, for a brief period at the start, but then I I, I don't especially for PTSD with compared to some of the other conditions, I think it's, I don't think they're, they're, they're good for that. And so, so yeah. it, it doesn't surprise me that you were treatment resistant and that you eventually, they, they tried to hospitalize you. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I had been in and out of the hospital. It just kind of got to where, okay, nothing's working. What's left. My doctor said, you know, let's do ECT. I consented. I signed myself in, um, Wait, but so immediately. How, so how how old are you um, when when you were hospitalized again? And so by people? this time it was um, I was twenty five. So okay. I had kind of run the gamut of all this, you know, this super, you know, very resistant treatment. De- sorry, treatment resistant depression, all kinds of meds. At that point, I wasn't. I was doing sleeping meds. Doing. I shouldn't say that. Way. Yeah. <laughs> Taking as prescribed. I always took things as prescribed and never did yeah. more. But sleep meds anxiety meds antidepressants okay had the ect well or so started let, it anyway let, let me ask you this so so mm-hmm. sleep meds like a like like a benzo or something or like an ambien or uh ambien visceral what was there like a visceral uh, you know what i've been on so many meds and i i haven't studied them for a while so i kind of get them That's, mixed were, up were you on any psychotics before um not you, before you went, uh, okay. not before ect okay. i wasn't um so that's kind of my theory is that they ended up treating brain injury with antipsychotics you know because okay. now <laughs> do you feel like um uh you, you know a lot of people respond to antidepressants and there's a the majority of people that have this general kind of emotional numbing, which for some people that can feel therapeutic at the time or for others, it can be kind of, um, activating in some way and they have more anxiety, but some more energy comes along with that. Like th- that's what I would say are the normal effects. Did you feel like you had the normal effects of the antidepressants you were on or, or were they making you I guess, worse in some way? And when I say that, it's like sometimes people start antidepressants and they just, their mood becomes more unstable. Their their lows are deeper. You know, they they become more irritable. And so, yeah. I guess the question is, like, do you think the meds were making you worse, or they, oh, absolutely. You okay. just at the time I couldn't recognize it because my doctor kept continually saying, "Your illness is progressing. Your illness is progressing." And so that was the message. I didn't understand what was happening to me. And I mean, I definitely over the time trying to get on, trying to get off, sometimes on my own, sometimes trying to convince him to like, you start to notice things, you start to notice withdrawal, although I didn't understand withdrawal back mm-hmm. then the way I do now, because there's obviously a lot more awareness, a lot more research, but I would notice if I cold turkey, because I would try to say, hey, these meds, I'm so sedated that I'm waking up on campus in a puddle of my own drool, I'm falling asleep at the wheel, I've gained you know, 50, 60 sure. pounds, um, t- trying to like, I can't live this way. The, these are so debilitating. I developed, I'd always been an extremely, I gained 50 pounds in the first three months. I, I know so we're kind of going all, all over the place all here. But, to, to age 25, like this is kind of what's happening to you on your first go around with them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, okay. So you get hospitalized again and they start talking to you about ECT. I mean, do you remember much of that conversation? I know sometimes it's the memory gets a bit um, distorted, like right before the treatment begins. I, I mean, do you remember any of those conversations? I don't remember any of the conversations. My husband does a little bit, but okay. he said, you know, basically it came down to we've tried all these medicines. She's getting worse. You know, nothing's working. This is kind of what's left. And I okay. consented to it. I agreed. I went in immediately. I sensed this is not what I need. And I began to fight to get out. I'm like, this isn't what I need. And, and it was just this constant, you know, pressure, this, this threats, coercion, you know, just basically. Well, t- tell me this because like um, usually mm-hmm. people think about ECT as a treatment for catatonia or a type of depression where people like essentially stop moving. You know, it's, uh, you mm-hmm. know, they're, they're very, very still. They stop eating. I was not catatonic. I was yeah. not catatonic. 
<laughs> what was the nature of your depression? Like when you went into the hospital, like, do you remember, like, was it like, I'm not sleeping or was it like, I was just really like agitated and uncomfortable. What, do, can you characterize the, I uh, guess the emotional crisis that, that had kind of been brewing for the months leading up to that? I mean, some of that's kind of, kind of foggy and probably sure. going back into my journals would have, you know, it could, could yeah. refresh some of that. I think it was just, I, I do remember talking like a lot. Um, I think I even journaled about this, about the sort of this hollow ache in my chest. I would feel this heaviness in my chest. I would feel this guilt. Um, and this is all after years on meds. So it's hard to know, okay, what's meds? What's kind of my own struggles, yeah, my yeah, own totally. existential issues, you know? Um, I mean, a deep sadness, uh, just feeling I'm kind of lost, um, okay. intense anxiety, you know, having panic attacks. And Well, what I'm hearing is it doesn't sound like you were catatonic or having, no. I guess, what we call psychomotor retardation style no. depression where you just essentially lie in bed and don't eat. Um, okay. No. So how long did it take? So after you did your first, uh, treatment how long did it take you to realize that i um, really don't want this it you know it, whether it was the first one or the second i don't remember but i know like pretty much immediately i'm like whoa <laughs> i sense okay. this is not what i need to heal like i i just knew you know and my, my counselor had always told me jill you have a really good you have really good instincts you have really good senses about people and Mm-hmm. It's you just need to learn to trust it and listen to it because I was trained not to trust my instincts. Well, my instincts were kicking in really strong. Jill, this is not what you need. And I was fighting mm-hmm. to get out. I was begging for a phone book. I was begging for an attorney. They would not give me a phone book. They would not let me speak to an attorney or any kind of advocate. Um, unfortunately, my husband was desperate by this point. Sure. The doctor saying, look, this is what she needs. Um, so he'd come to visit me, you know, I'm like, get me phone book, get me out of here. I'm just kind of desperate. And he wouldn't because he's trusting the process. That's that's what everyone does, right? Because when something like severe depression happens, or maybe it was a drug induced problem, you don't know what to do, but you trust that there's experts out there that could help you. And that's kind of how everyone is raised and, and what, what everyone does in that situation that so that doesn't really surprise me either uh, how, yeah. how many how many courses uh, i mean how many sessions did you have in in your first uh, go around with ect so i was there about two and a half weeks i had eight um mm-hmm. and they had let me out a couple times for um i'm reading my records i was able to get some of my records they had let me out a couple times for um like a leave of absence. I don't remember what they were. One of them, I might've gone to see my sister because I think she had, that was right when she had a baby. So probably one was to see my sister. So obviously they wouldn't have let me out if I was acutely suicidal. Right. So, but, but after one of the, the second um, leave of absence, I came back, they were wanting to do the strip search. I think a family member had dropped me off back, you know, trying to piece things together between what they remember and and what I remember. But um, I think my mother-in-law or somebody said they dropped me off. Um, I get back up there. I'm by myself, you know, in the hospital. I didn't have family there. And they were wanting me to do the strip search, which was always just humiliating. I'd always been extremely private about my body, never comfortable being naked around anyone. And so I was like refusing to do the strip search and I was just like, you know what? I'm done. I'm going home. This isn't, I'm just done. And so piecing together with the records and kind of the bits that I remember, um, the records say that I was wanting to leave AMA, you know, that I was refusing to do the ECT and that they called to get a court order to detain me. And really, they I went in consenting. They said I had good insight. You know, I mean, yes, I was struggling a lot. There was no documentation that I was suicidal. There was nothing when I had come back to the hospital, nothing saying she's psychotic. She's, you know, sure. suicidal. She's threatening anyone. Absolutely nothing for them to justify detaining me. And I remember being cornered in a room. And I don't remember exactly what was said, but it, I definitely was feeling threatened. So if Maybe they were talking court order at that point or whatever it was. I knew I knew I wasn't going to get out of it. Oh, my and God. I was basically coerced and threatened into staying, into continuing the treatment. I didn't want to be there. 
And it was obvious. They said, you know, after that, that I was angry the, the rest of the time. Um, I was saying, you know, do you, oh, do you was feel that part good? of you your underlying condition people? as well? Yeah. What did you say? Being angry that they were involuntarily detaining you. Yeah, you know, like well, like that know, was a sign of my illness that I was angry yeah. that they're locking yeah. me up with no because yeah. they had no court order. You know, they had no yeah. court order. They had no legal reason, no documentation that I was suicidal, threatening psychotic, anything like that. So what they did was completely illegal. And I was actually um, studying to work in the field of mental health. I was, I was pursuing a degree in, in social services and t- focusing on mental health. Mm-hmm. And so like, I, I was like, I don't need a, I don't need a record of forced, you know, like court ordered treatment. Jesus. So I went along, but I basically was still fighting it the whole way, you know, trying to fight it from the inside, but knowing I was powerless, there was nothing I could do. Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting thing that you bring up. It's like, it's not really like consenting if someone tells you, Hey, if you don't sign yourself involuntarily, we're going to put an involuntary hold on you. And, and I know in some States it's like, you can't, buy a gun you can't have a gun in your house i mean there's there's a whole range of things that happen i mean i know for some professional boards uh you need to disclose whether you've had um um involuntary psychiatric treatment i imagine if you're a police officer or you wanted to go to the military those would be questions you would have to answer truthfully so involuntary psychiatric commitment carries uh consequences um yeah yeah. And I, I can't say that I fully understood those laws completely at the time. Well, but well they don't tell you at the time. That's I the learned thing. enough of it you know, in, you know, they, in school to know yeah. that could happen and that there are repercussions. Yeah. I didn't understand quite all the details and legalities of it. But but the whole the whole setting is threatening and coercive. I, I do remember they had this this chair sitting in the hallway. It was a restraint chair and it was old wooden really straight chair with these thick leather straps and it looked like an electrocution chair like an yeah, old electrocution i mean jill chair. there's so many suspect things about this hospital <laughs> like the whole idea of like strip searches i mean i've never seen that but the fact that they were doing strip searches at the time i mean it seems so old school and like a bad strange yeah that was in 2001 so. yeah um, <laughs> um because normally what I see is they just you know they throw some scrubs at you and they say change and and then they let you go in but it's it, that. All the strip searches, every every hospitalization, you had to remove yeah. one piece of clothing at a time. It's almost literally like like you're doing a strip tease for them. You know, like you have to remove one and then they hold it up and they're looking through it. Well, and- sounds like that's a common thing then. Like, I mean, that's a part of the admission that I haven't seen. So maybe that is more common than I imagine. Like this kind of like, hey, let's make sure there's no drugs like hiding in your pants now. And you're going to remove them and I'm going to check all the pockets and now you can have your pants back. Oh, yeah. Or something like and that. In one okay. sense, I Maybe. understand it. But if you know anything about trauma, especially somebody who's been oh. has sexual trauma, it's like the worst thing you can do. So so the sense of powerlessness, you're stuck in this environment, you're locked in. These people are controlling your body. They're they're taking your clothes off. I'm having young male techs watching me different hospitalizations. I would have for some reason, they always assigned me these young male techs that were like, I don't know, 1920s. But how old they were, they looked really young. And like, they're literally watching you shower. They're sitting there watching you shower. They're watching you change your tampon. They're watching you change your clothes. You know, like it's not trauma informed, right? (laughs) It's not, you know, they could at least assign to me a female. (laughs) If you don't have a trauma history, I, I, I think usually it's, it's better to have, like, if you're on suicide watch and someone really needs to be on line of sight or one-to-one, like ideally it's a woman, you know, and, you know, and if the person has a trauma history, it should never be a man, uh, especially if it was trauma, uh, sexual trauma from a man yeah. to woman. So, um, so you're just in there, yeah. terrified, dehumanized, completely powerless. You know, you're in survival mode. You're desperate. You know, and it, you know, the thing is. You can't get help. Half the time, you can't even access a phone. So even if somebody were like raping in the hospital, you can't even get help. If you call somebody saying, hey, I'm in a psych ward and they're abusing me or raping me, whatever, you're going to get hung up on, right? I actually, at one point when I was in the ECT hospital, I stole a phone book from the nurse's station because I was going to try to call a lawyer to get me out. And they had these little booths and I'm in there and I'm desperate calling. I think it was leaving messages. Maybe I was talking to secretaries. Of course, if if the attorneys ever even returned the phone call, you know, like the nurses were even going to tell me these attorneys were, you know, I'm sure 
whether or not they did, I don't know. I will never know. No. And yeah, it's, it's one of these things as well. Like you're calling from a psych unit, you know? Yeah. And, and then it's like, I don't, I, yeah, the attorney, I mean, it's just, it's just like a level of powerlessness because where do you even find an attorney who's skilled at challenging involuntary holds and who might be doing this work for people who don't have stacks and stacks of resources, right? Yeah. You, it's like you're already in that situation. You don't know the number to call. And it's, it, I mean, it really is like once you're there, it is completely powerless. Yeah. Which yeah. is, again, the worst thing because trauma mm-hmm. is often defined by where, where you're powerless, right? You're powerless. And somebody's doing something to your body against your will. That's kind of like a lot of, you know, the root of trauma. And they're recreating the same trauma that led you to seek help, that led you into the system, you know. So, Jill, tell me this. So so you had eight treatments and then you left for good or did you have eight and then they kept you for more? No. So according to the records, um, my last treatment, they discharged me with an – I don't know, a couple hours of my final treatment. Um, and, and so that within was eight. less than a, what'd you say? Was that eight? Yeah. Eight treatments. Okay. So okay. about every other day they do like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So okay. I was there about two and a half weeks. Did you, um, did it, uh, did it help? Not at all. So, it, okay. it, well, yeah. if you could call this help, this is all that my, my husband yeah. observed okay. was that on the day I had ECT, I was kind of like, Oh, smiley and kind of you know docile and smiley and whatever but all the days in between he said i was extremely agitated i was extremely angry um there was no progression in my mood before i mean during throughout the treatment or after within a week i attempted suicide so obviously did not help my mood at all who knows how much of that was related to the trauma the situation of being brain injured or the fact that it just doesn't help everyone um so there was no, what's interesting though, is that even though they're charting, their charting is basically showing I'm getting increasingly more agitated, more upset. Um, you know, I'm having lapses in memory. I started getting some weird behaviors. Um, and they, they basically discharged me with a global assessment of functioning 35 points higher than when I entered. Now, first of all, you can't even fully assess global assessment of functioning in that situation. But for them, there was nothing in their charting to justify a 35 in point increase in my gaff. So like to them, it's like, oh, we rubber stamped this. Oh, look, we did this fabulous thing for this girl and basically left, you know, sent me out traumatized, brain injured you know, and well, yes. Yeah, so t- talk to me about that. Um, what were the, you know, what was going on after afterwards? Cause, okay. So you definitely, it sounds like you were still having irritability, agitation, and just not doing well. And you became suicidal. At what point did you start having symptoms that I guess now you look back on and we're just like, Hey, some of these were like ECT problems. I, I know, I know a lot of it is like cognitive impairment, sometimes like muscle twitches and things like that. But like yeah. when, when did you, and, and, and not everyone gets those, especially after like just eight treatments, but sometimes they do. So, so when did you feel like you started to get, um, you started to notice side effects of ECT? Well, I mean, basically it was immediately cause, uh, yeah. Well, I even remember coming out of it like, you know, when you watch a movie and it's like a war movie and there's like sort of that blast, you know, where there's a blast yeah. and they can't hear anything and it's like muffled, but their ears are ringing insanely. I just remember after every treatment, I'd wake up and I'd have this ringing and my head would just be like, it felt like it was absolutely going to explode. Worst headache I've ever felt in my life. And I would have like this gel all crusted up in my hair. Everybody, you knew it's shock day because people would be drooling and they'd have all this gel crusted Oof. up in their hair. They don't even bother to like wipe it off or anything. It's really dehumanizing. So it's like you're walking around. And yeah. Um, so um, I remember the headaches. I remember the ringing in the ears. But I went into the hospital, a practicing photographer. Photography literally was my life. It was my salvation. It was my identity at this point. It had become, you know, it was a huge part of my life. It was like a lifestyle for me. Everything in my life was photography. I carried my camera everywhere. It was my job. It was my my f- social group. It was sure. uh, my passion. It was my therapy. You know, yeah. I could go in the dark room and just express myself artistically, mm-hmm. my pain into my work. And so that was completely erased. Years of practice of knowledge, everything. I walked in, a practicing photographer, walked out. I picked up my camera. I didn't even know 
what to do. I mean, I knew it was a camera. I knew it took pictures, but here's this, this, it was like an extension of my body, you know, okay. all customized, all these settings to work the way I needed to work. You know, true photographers don't just put things in audit, right? They have it all, you know, yeah. you're doing all this, you know, <laughs> and I picked it up and I'm like, I don't know. It's like, it was like this foreign artifact. I didn't even know what to do with it. All, all photography concepts. I didn't know what aperture, what shutter speed, what any of that meant. Anymore. Did, that, did that come back after a couple of months or was that just going for good at that point? Well, it never came back. It basically came. Well, I, I, at one point I tried, it went to the photo co-op group and I brought my camera and we were going to have like a, you bring in work and we critique each other's work. And I remember bringing my camera in and I was just like, guys, I don't know how to use this thing anymore. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, since I had that treatment, like, I don't know what to do with this thing. And they spent all this time trying to like, okay, this is for this and trying to explain what all these, you know, kind of some basic concepts and this button's for this and everything. And I, I like, I couldn't make sense of anything they said. So they just wow. like, I finally give up. They put it in full auto. Wow. But it came, what it came down to was I never, it never just came back. I basically had to start from scratch and relearn. I had to sit down with my textbooks and my notes and go back in my dark room. And, and I remember sitting and I pulled out, I had my camera and I pulled out like my manuals back when they actually had paper manuals. Cause, and I went through page by page, page one. Okay. This button is this here and this does this. And then looking wow. at the books. Okay. It was like starting from scratch. It was completely erased did, from did me. Did you have any other problems apart from that? Um, I guess the, the, the memory impairment with how to use a camera, like did, did you see it turn up in other ways in your life? Yeah. I'm one of, one of the really, I mean, there were a lot of little things looking back, like, I mean, to me, I knew certain things were erased. There were important memories erased, a, a vacation my husband and I took, our best friend's wedding. There were things that were erased. And I knew, okay, yeah, there were things erased. But um, for years, and this, in my diary, I was talking about this, I think it was three years after ECT, three or four years, where I couldn't, well, one, word finding. And another thing was I could be mid-sentence and just, and, you know, here I'm in my 20s. I'm not like, sure. you know, somebody that should be developing dementia and having these issues. I mean, I'm educated, you know, I'm smart, all these things. I shouldn't be having these problems. Like, I could start, I'd say, like, a few words, and before I even finished a sentence, I couldn't remember the words I just said. Okay. And I would sometimes just completely freeze up, or I'd say, hey, did I say this? Did I talk about it? And be like... Did you talk about what? Did you talk about? Because I, I okay. literally could not remember. Or they'd be like, no, Jill, you've just talked about this five times already. And, and all of this time after ECT, I imagine you're still on multiple meds, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think they were cranking up the meds. Here I am getting worse. They're just cranking up. And then I one of the something after ECT, something triggered some mania. Whatever it was they put me on, it triggered some mania. And... Okay. Oh, then the doctor was like, oh, My that's why disorder. the ECT didn't yeah. work. Because yeah. you didn't actually have treatment resistant depression. Yeah. You have bipolar. And it's like, oops. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so now they're adding. So then I ended up taking for years, like eight psychotropics. You know, I'm on lithium. I'm oh, on, Jesus. you know, anticonvulsants. I'm on, on multiple antipsychotics. I'm on, you know, they, they I was doing some self injury. So there he's giving me Revia sure. to try to like dampen, you know, whatever it, okay. it just drug to the hilt. You know, you don't know up from down, you can barely function. So, so, Oh yeah. To back to some of the other things I noticed was I couldn't remember phone numbers of my friends. I couldn't remember appointments and dates. I had, I would start like writing things on my arms okay. and on my hands like, Oh, Oh, I have an, I have a doctor's appointment today. Oh, I've got, you know what I mean? I actually remember my doctor being in an, uh, one of my appointments and he's like, what do you have written all over your arm? I said, well, I've, this is how I have to remember things. I write things on my arm and I don't even know if that time, if I was relating that to the ECT, some of it, it's weird looking back. You're like, Oh wait, that's that was from ECT. Some of it I knew. I think some of it, looking back, I can make that connection. So, so Joe, did you only have one go around with ECT, or did you? Because 
because a lot of people they'll have multiple courses like they'll end up in a hospital two years later and they'll get like another series sometimes they do outpatient ect yeah were you, were you one and done or, or did you get pulled into it again no thank god no i mean first of all it was obvious it didn't help me you know okay. it actually made me worse I, I think my husband probably would have fought tooth and nail you know i mean okay I'm getting worse. I attempt suicide after. I mean, even my, I, I doubt my doctor would have suggested it again that the same one. I don't know that it didn't come to that. Um, and I do want to bring this up because I think it's, it's really important. Um, and this is something I've observed in all, every single person I know who's had ECT and developed issues afterwards, every single one I'm talking in groups with hundreds of people. I'm talking about people I've spoken with around the world, people I've known personally, Okay. Um, every single one, same issue is when they report these problems after ECT, they hear the exact same thing. Oh no, ECT can't do that. That's your depression. Depression causes mm -hmm. memory problems, depression. Cro and, and every, for many, many appointments after ECT, I would try to talk to my doctor. I'm like, no, what did it do to me? I'm like, it, it did something to my brain. I'm not the same. It, it, it did something. He deny it. He deny it, deny it. And one point he looked at me and he goes, is your life worth remembering anyway? You know, and here oh, wow. you have this person oh, who my God. struggled with self-esteem, with, with trauma, with, you know, feelings of worthlessness to have your own doctor look at you and tell you and ask you if your life is even worth remembering. And I, like I said, I still, despite a lot of pain, I really still had a rich, beautiful life, a lot of wonderful things in my life. And for him to negate my life in that way, you know, and it, it was just, <laughs> you feel about this big, you know, it's, it's yeah, kind of, yeah, that's awful. <laughs> um, so, so, okay. So you're on, so you've been injured by ECT. It sounds like you have an awareness of it, but they're just kind of writing it off or, or not taking it seriously. You're getting nuked by medications. When did you realize that you wanted to leave, leave, I guess, psychiatry behind and the meds behind? What was the, what was the story to getting to that decision? Cause I know you're tapering now with, with a doc and everything. How, how did that happen? So <laughs> we often refer to the mind fuckery of, sorry, if I'm not supposed to say that, if you need to bleep that out of psychiatry, it's, yeah. it's like I spent years like, in one sense, believing that I had this illness, in one sense, like, I think a lot of this is actually bu bullshit. I remember many times when I would try to get off my meds on my own because they never will help you. I'd be like, you know what? I think I'm just a really intense, emotional, sensitive, artistic person. I don't think I'm really ill. You know, so you're constantly like, you're inundated with this belief, right? That you have this illness, you have this chemical balance, you'll have it for life. You're always going to need these meds to, to fix you. I mean, my doctor was constantly saying to me, you will be dead without these medications. You will be dead. And it was like, it, I was constantly hearing the message. This is, this little pill is the only thing that is keeping you alive as if there's nothing within you personally within your circumstances that is tying you to life besides this little drug so you, it's, you're it's kind of like the model this. right you know when you're in the medical model for it it's like you have this medical condition and this is the treatment there's no i guess uh, latitude in considering other things like i don't know your personal resilience or maybe maybe life is easier now maybe there's been some progress in in um, the severity of the PTSD symptoms, because sometimes they mellow out for some people, and and so there's a, yeah. a number of number of different ways at looking at uh, do, do you really need medications? But I, I don't think a lot of doctors see it like that. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I mean, from the get go, it was like, hey, the, you need this just like diabetes need. I mean, he literally said that you need this in the same way that diabetics need insulin. And I've heard this a million times from other people. Oh yeah. My doctor used that same line. I mean, he said, Jill, it would be cruel to deprive you of these medicines. And, but then, you know, over the years, not everything adds up, but you've learned, this is my role. Nobody's listening to me. My job, take these meds or you're going to get locked up, you know? But you know, that idea of no one listening to you is like really common when 
I hate to say this, but you know, when you're like, if you're in the county mental health system or maybe you're sometimes even just seeing like a uh, psychiatrist on insurance with the visits being 15 minutes long or maybe 25 minutes long, if you're lucky, um, it's so just like kind of checklist psychiatry, like a kind of a protocol, you know, you have, what symptoms are you having, this and that, and it's just like, yeah. whoa, 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 it's all whoa, about whoa. symptoms. I don't want to hear anything else, okay? Like, and then it's yeah. like, we're just going to continue this and we're going to bump this up a little bit. And so yeah. that feeling of like, I don't really feel like they kind of care about me. No, and, and no. I teacher. mean, he didn't care that I, I would come into him with, Scientific articles. Okay, this drug you're giving me is like destroying my brain, causing brain shrinkage, you know, and he'd be like, well, it's better than being dead. I'm like, okay, I've gained massive amounts. I ended up gaining 120 pounds. And I'm talking, I'm someone who was like naturally extremely thin. I was anorexic at one point, but by nature, I was always very thin, active, you know. So for me to gain more than double my own body weight and turn it, morph into something that I don't even recognize in a mirror was awful right here they've changed my body now i'm developing blood sugar problems now i'm developing lipid problems and you know so like it's destroying my health i'm morbidly obese (laughs) i'm terrified to even go anywhere in public because i feel so fat and disgusting i'm so fat that i can't get up and exercise i'm i'm tired i am obsessing about food that the the amount of hunger that the zyprexa triggered this insatiable hunger it was like this gnawing it was almost like this animal gnawing at my stomach just like this gnawing 24 hours a day so you develop all these food obsessions all you can think about is food and so they've destroyed my health they're destroying my brain they're destroying so it was about impossible now to get through college i did and i i still i even graduated with distinction like at the top of my class but the amount of energy the amount of effort it took to do that when i am so heavily sedated like i said i would i would you know, somebody who would show up to, you know, before ECT, yeah. before all, you know, I would even, mm-hmm. well, actually, even with, and what's funny is, even with my depression, even with my anxiety, and all the things I was struggling with, I was, you know, showed up to class on time, everything already read, assignments, all, you know, always turned in on time, um, you know, so despite my struggles, I was functioning, you know, yeah. I was doing what I needed to do on the job, doing what I needed to do in school, I was still... You know, so anyway, I know I'm kind of jumping around. Well, this. Yeah, let's let's go back back to what, yeah. what what led you to, I guess, start questioning everything to the point where you're like, I need off. I need I need to find. Yeah. So, so like I said, I had developed a lot of health issues from the medicines that the, the massive weight gain, the blood sugar issues, the the cholesterol. Um, and so I ended up in grad school for clinical mental health counseling. I started that fall of 2018. Um, and I loved the program. Um, I noticed it was very, very, my classmates could take four classes and work full time. And I've got four kids and I'm, you know, taking care of my, like they had a million things on their plate and they could do it. And I'm like, I tried two classes. It was like too much. I'm trying one. Now I'm doing one class. Now I could get a great grade, but I would have to study. It would take me between 10 and 12 hours a day, six to seven days a week to do one class. Yeah. And it's not because I'm not intelligent. Yeah, I mean, you're push, pushing through the sludge of Zyprexa and, and yeah. all, all the drugs. You know, yeah. It, well, in brain injury, you know, yeah, it took injury, me course, so yeah. long to read yeah. it. Um, I would, you know, I was sedated from the meds. It was just so, so difficult. And it got to where, like, I could write a paper and I could get excellent grades on papers. Um, I struggled more so with testing because that's more like memorization. So that was harder for me than when I was younger. And, you know, so I'd kind of have to make up for what I lost on my tests with my papers and my projects and presentations. But it would take me at least... 10 minutes to read one textbook page. I mean, you have hundreds of pages to read. I mean, so it was, was like this a- like struggle when you were comparing yourself to the other, your other colleagues. Was that a big part of like being like, Hey, something's not right with this. Yeah. Be- and my, my friends would ask me, cause some of my friends would think about going to grad school. Hey, you know, how's that working out as a mom? And you know, and I'd be like, it's really hard. I'm like, I'm like, I'm getting good grades. I said, and I'd tell them how much I'd be working. They're like, Oh my gosh, really? Maybe I don't want to go to grad school. I had no ideas. And I'm like, 
I'm like, well, I don't really understand why it's so hard for me because my classmates are, you know, have all these other things. And it didn't make sense to me, right? Why it was so hard. But looking back over my life, yeah, everything had always for, you know, basically since the brain injury, things were very hard. My All my friends passed me up with degrees and, and it, I had gotten to where I figured out I had to keep my life extremely simple because I would get overwhelmed. I would get so... Cool. You know, my one class, I'm not working. I just did a little bit of volunteer work. And so anyway, back to your question. So kind of what was sort of the undoing with some of the classes I took. I took a class in trauma and grief. And I had no idea how much that would trigger past trauma. And it wasn't even triggering childhood trauma as much as it was ECT trauma. I mean, yeah, childhood trauma kind of because I realized Hey, that was never addressed, and I got thrown in the system. It, like things started clicking, so it was triggering this trauma majorly. Like, and the thing is, I never ever had a chance to sorry process that trauma, heal from that trauma. And then I took a class, and I can't remember what it was called, but basically it was talking kind of about the mental health system. And they were talking about Mad Pride, and they were talking about consumer rights, and all these different movements that I was totally unaware of. I mean, I knew bad things were happening. I had vowed, even back years ago, even in the hospital, I would be telling the doctors and nurses, I'm going to get out someday, and I'm going to change the system, because what you're doing to people are terrible, of course, and you're drugged and everything. So it started clicking to me. (laughs) Are you on a journey to taper off psychiatric medications and looking for help? Our practice specializes in designing and overseeing medication tapers. Our services are available for patients living in select states across the US. If you're interested in learning more, just click the link below this video and check out our website to discover more details about our program. You just come here and you click the red button right there. Thanks. Um, but you're still taking meds at this time. So when, when did you go, I need off of this? Because that's because, because you know, the one part of it is just like, forced like essentially coerced ECT is 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 bad but then there's this like I think there's another step where you get to the point where you're just like this is all a lot of shit like it hasn't really helped me and like I need to flee from here as soon as possible yeah so years be I think it was like 2017 I started talking I was with a different psychiatrist I was with the one that prescribed the ECT for 10 years he started getting weird he started wanting to talk about religion and, and very personal sex things and it got really strange so I transferred to her she's in the same practice she was kind of uh, a little better in some ways but um I told her I wanted to get off the Zyprexa or, you know, switch to something else. I said, look, I've gained massive amounts of weight. You know, I'm getting very unhealthy. And she's like, okay, yeah, but we need to put you on another antipsychotic because, you know, you have to have this antipsychotic. So I actually did wean off of it for a long time. Um, I don't know that she necessarily understood about withdrawing, but I think she just really was like terrified of me getting off and, maybe felt a little fear and reluctance on my part. Cause I was told this, basically this was the drug that was keeping me alive for years. Right. So, yeah, and, 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 so, they, and they know, right. Because yeah, they, they don't really know how to taper the drugs because they've been told like again and again at conferences and in journal articles, Oh, it's not, not that big of a deal to stop them. You know, it, it'll, it'll be fine in a couple of weeks, but then what they see when they do this or what they see when people come off the meds is they go, Oh no, they're going to be destabilized. They're going to be in the hospital. They're going to start calling me wanting like same day visits and just like <laughs> calling me for emergencies. I'm going to have to start calling like doctors and hospitals to talk about what's going on with the patient. Yeah. And they're just like, oh, I really don't want that drama of this person becoming unstable. I'm just going to tell them to keep on taking the meds because I know it's, it's going to keep things simple. Yeah. 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 And so I think I just got to the point, this is was my thinking about Zyprexa was, you know, all the people, whether it's family or friends or doctors telling me, you, you need to take this medicine. I'm thinking to myself, gosh, I could end up having to have like limbs chopped off because I could develop severe diabetes. Diabetes. They're not the ones who have to live with I the mean, severe I mean, it sounds like you were on your way if you were, yeah. what, like two, 250 pounds at some point, something like that? Yeah, I was over, yeah, I was over like 210, you know, and okay. um, it was, yeah, it was insane. So, um, so I just decided for myself, 
I know other people are going to object, but I need to at least change this one medicine because it's, I know it's, I'm going to die an early death and it's probably going to be an ugly, painful death, you know, yeah. like severe diabetes. So I made the decision to change that one medicine. She switched me to, um, Seroquel, which supposedly didn't have quite as bad of the, you know, the weight gain issues. I mean, I think it's still bad, but not quite as bad yeah. as Iprexa. Um, so anyway, um, so because of these classes in grad school, and I started realizing, like, this is a, st a systemic problem. Like, looking back, I'm like, ethics are virtually non-existent. Human rights are virtually non-existent. Like, what they're doing to people, like, I really started piecing together the system, that it wasn't just me running into a few bad doctors. You know, this wasn't just a few random, like it's a systemic problem. And I, I called up one of my, um, I, I called my ethics professor and I'm like, you know, I'm just feeling like really bad about being in the system. And I feel like I want to do something because I, I don't, you know, I don't think patients' rights are being protected. I think we're hurting people. And I shared with her my experience with ECT and how awful it was. And um, she said, well, I said, I want to start working on like, legislation to ban it like i want to start talking to the legislator she said well here what do you need to talk to this other professor because he's done a lot of legislative work mm -hmm. i talked to him explained my story and he's like you know he gave me lots of advice about how you do this because he he worked over 20 years and passing different mental health legislation and he gave me a lot of good advice and he said you're going to need an army. You're going to need professionals backing up what you're saying. You're going to need other victims. They said, these people are going to want to silence you. You're going to be rocking the boat. You're going to be, you know, messing with an industry. It's making a lot of money and, you know, you can't just do this on your own. This is, this is a, a war, not just a battle. This is a war and you got to be in for it, the long, in for it for the long haul. You know, this isn't something you're going to change overnight, but this is mm -hmm. something that I was saying way back 20 some years ago, I was telling the doctors and nurses sure. I wanted to do. And now I'm like, finally going to do it. So part of that was me. I had started developing other physical health problems. I, I was developing some of this is hard to know. Okay. How much is this is brain injury, electrical injury, how much is drug related when you're on all that stuff? It's hard to know, but there's definitely within the literature, there's a lot of consistencies sure. with, um, Electrical injuries and brain injuries, they're basically damaging your nervous system, which is kind of controlling, you know, most of your body function. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I had a lot of digestive issues, um, a lot of like urinary bowel issues. I developed horrible constipation, which made me develop like a prolapse. So I come into my doctor mm -hmm. <laughs> saying, hey, I need to get off of this or at least start weaning. I wanted to get to where I'm off of the Seroquel because I didn't know at that point. I was attributing it to the Seroquel. And, and, and give, me, give me some signposts right now. So so how, uh -huh. how old are you currently and how old were you when you wanted to come off the Seroquel? So let's see. This was this was maybe about a little over two years ago. And okay. this is the first time I had brought my husband into an appointment with me, with my psychiatrist. Okay. At least with this so, psychiatrist. I think years ago he'd gone to some of them. This is the first okay. time he'd never met this lady. But I kind of wanted a backup because I knew she'd be how resistant. Old, how old are you now? So that would have been I'm oh, sorry, sorry, no, 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 about your, 45. Your age, your age currently. What, how, how old are you at the I'm moment? I'm 47 now. Okay. So at 45, so, so, so you're, you're essentially in this system really, I guess, since like you're 19 – feeling really off about what's going on for quite some time, but feeling like you can't really have anything to do with any, any real way to get out. And then, so about two yeah. years ago, you start really pursuing. Like, yeah. Time, Cause time I was realizing how it was impacting yeah. my physical health so much, you know, it, yeah. okay. I, I knew there were things going on in the system. I was really like, I'm getting older now. I've got to live with the, the, the consequences. So I was attributing, um, a lot of my constipation, which was causing this prolapse oh, and, you know, it was, yeah, to, to that, yeah. you know, and so my husband, I'm like, I kind of needed some backup, right? Because I knew she was going to be resistant about it. And I go in and this was kind of like the end of my relationship with the psychiatrist. It ended really ugly. But so she, so, well, another thing I wanted to talk about an advanced directive because, you know, I'm like, I absolutely don't want ECT again. I wanted to sign this advanced directive. Sure. I come in saying, 
I want an advanced directive. And she, well, what's that? She had no clue what an advanced directive is. I tried to explain it to her and she's like, well, why do you need this? She couldn't figure out why I was so set on getting. And I said, look, and my husband jumped into it and, you know, he's trying to help me. He's like, she had a horrifically traumatic experience with ECT. She'd feel a lot better if we could get something in writing saying, you know, she's not going to get this again. And the doctor basically was like, oh, you know, Jill, I don't understand why you're so concerned. I've never once seen you unstable all the time I've worked with you. You know, you're well-functioning, you're stable. But she's but just going like on and on right? about it. Because you look back on it and you're just like, no, this is <laughs> – I'm, I'm maybe like a shadow of my former self in some ways. Yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. but she's just basically gushing about how well I'm doing. But then yeah. she did agree to drop the dose a little bit. And then I said, okay, all right, well then. And the time before I'd had her drop it because I said, look, I think this is making me so foggy. I can't even do my schoolwork. I can't stay awake. I'm just stiff. So she had agreed to that drop. Now I'm asking her to drop it again. She was kind of reluctant, but okay, fine. We'll drop it down. I said, okay, well, next time we'll drop it down. She goes, well, Jill, then by that point, this is only um, useful for sleep. And I said, that sounds good. And she just was like, if you think you're not ill, we have a problem. We got to talk about it. And she was just going off on me. And she said, we're not going to talk about it today. And I left there. It's well, first of all, because it's she your was brother, saying. Right? And it should be well, like, you, you, you should consent to what you take. And if you're just like, you know what? Yeah. I really don't want to take it at this dose anymore. And she should be like, okay, uh, let me let me get creative with you to figure out how we can do this because you've decided. But it, it sounds like you got a lecture and she sort of – Oh, yeah. And here – I mean I hadn't been consider. in the hospital for – I mean since before my kids were born and now my kids are teenagers, right? And mm -hmm. so she just sat there and gushed about how stable I am and why am I concerned? Why do I need this advanced directive? And all this stuff, she's just going on and on and on. And as soon as it was clear to her that I wanted to get off this medicine, that's when this whole, you know, you're ill and we need to have a conversation. You think you're not ill, blah, 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 you know, like throwing it back in my face. And so, so I'm getting mad. She's starting to talk about like, well, what is it you wouldn't want us to do anyway in the hospital? I said, well, I don't want drugs. I don't want shocks and I don't want restraints. She's like, she goes, well, what do you expect us to do? And I'm like, I do counseling. And she just is like, oh, well, yeah. well here I've taken away all their tools, right? We're taking away their yeah. drugs, their shocks, their restraints. That's all they got. Yeah. You know, so she was just kind of getting all in this tizzy, you know, well, we're, we're going to have to deal with this. And I got in the car and I was just irate. And my husband at one point put his hand on my thigh because here I'm starting to just, he's like, honey, <laughs> you're like, well, documenting like what's a, interesting. It's interesting. So now my insight range. dropped, right? You know, all yeah. my other appointments, I have really good insight. Well, now when I get my, chart you know my insight has <laughs> dropped ten, because you know, now i'm even questioning if i'm ill you know <laughs> how many and, and let me ask you this how many times were you hospitalized in that space between like 25 to, to 45 um I'm trying to think when well between there so no i my hospitalizations i might have been hospitalized a couple of times after ecg i had nine total hospitalizations I think only yeah. maybe two after ECT, but I got really good at quit talking, right? Quit telling yeah. them what you're thinking. Just shut up, take the meds, leave your appointment, right? And I got really good at learning to not question, except my, my fate in life was to swallow these meds and do my best and suppress emotions. And I don't think all that emotions, I think a lot of emotion suppression was from the drugs, but I had learned Talking is dangerous. You don't share your emotions. You don't share your thoughts. Don't overthink you things. Just essentially go in there, just saying, you know, these. I think these changes have really benefited me. I'm feeling a lot calmer. Like I'm feeling less suicidal. And that, and then you're just like, I'm going to shut up. And then in like three days, they'll let me go. Yeah, I mean, you just you don't talk in appointments. You don't talk in hospital. That's what how I learned. And this is what's interesting: how I learned to quit going in the hospital and how to get out of the hospital. I would steal my chart in the hospital. That's when they still had like stacks of paper charts sitting around the nurse's station. I would steal my chart and I would see, hey, I, I said to them, hey, you know, I'm going to fight this. I'm going to get out of the system and stop you from hurting people. And they would chart, you know, delusions of grandeur or I, you know, so I learned what to say, what not to say. If I say this, they chart this. If I show this emotion or this, they'll, I, I learned how they twist our words, you know, and so you kind of learn this line you have to walk, what you have to say, what you can't say, how to act, how not to act, to get out. And that's how I learned 
not to get back in. I mean, I learned, I started learning how to get out more quickly. And then I learned what to do or not to do to get back in. So then I did have a period. Let me ask you this. Has this been really hard on your husband? Because I imagine like oh, yeah. the, the other thing is it's like, um, and, and when you went in the hospital, was it mostly because you were having like suicidal thoughts? Was that the, the main thing that brought you in there? Yeah, I was, I would have suicidal thoughts, um, suicidal plans. Um, there were, I did OD twice, the, the one time before ECT and then, you know, shortly after ECT. Um, because so yeah, I, I mean, I've, you told your husband, like, don't call the psychiatrist, don't call the hospital. But then it's like, I wonder if like that becomes challenging for you because he's like, well, who do I call? And like, what do I do when like, you know, things are going really bad? I, I, I don't know if you could kind of speak to that about the kind of pressure that it puts in like a relationship when you're just like, I can't do that anymore. But obviously there's still like some instability going on. The fact is I didn't, I think my life had gotten so simplified. I ended up being a stay at home mom and yeah, it's tough, but my life was still very simple in a sense. Right. Um, so I had really gone, you know, over 15 years, very stable. And part of that, you know, I'm drugged to the hilt. Part of it, I had learned just, just to kind of swallow things, not overthink things. I learned to keep my stress extremely low, uh, I, I mean, I think it was a combination of personal growth, of maturing, of learning to simplify my life, learning to not question, not overthink, you know, kind of suppress, learn how to, you know, if I just don't think about things, sure. I don't get so overwhelmed, right? I don't. So it was a kind of a blend of things, but very, very long period of stability, right? Not in the okay. hospital, okay. you know. Um, so, right. um, yeah. Um, okay. So, so. Were you able to keep on working with this doctor or did you have to find another one? So at that point, I said to my husband, I'm like, I am not going to go back to that woman and listen to her tell me how ill I am. I'm like, I cannot. I will not submit to her. I will not listen to her tell me how ill I am when I have literally been stable for, you know, since our, before our kids were born. I said, I will not go back to her. And of course, now I'm like, oh, shit, I'm going to run out of my meds. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to run out of my meds. And I know, you know, I'm already aware of withdrawal, right? And I'm like kind of in a panic, making tons of phone calls. Like, but I did end up finding a psychiatrist and I, and I went into him. He's really a great guy. I mean, he fully acknowledges the trauma of the mental system, the childhood trauma, like that the ECT experience was horrible. But he was the very, the psychiatrist was the very first person because I was having tons of neurological issues, having tons of like, twitches and spasms and I, my hands would go numb for months and I could barely use them and all sorts of weird like neurological things you know just tons mm -hmm. of and I and he was like I don't I think he was a neurologist psychiatrist practicing as a psychiatrist and I said you know could any of this have anything to do with ECT I mean they are like running electricity through your body and you know and he's like actually yeah and he gets on his computer and he's looking it up and He's like, Jill, I don't really know how to help you. He said, it looks like the kind of brain scans that can identify if you've got, like, injury from ECT or, like, experimental. They're not just something you can go order. And he's like, yeah, I think it totally could be from the ECT. I just don't know where to send you. What, you know, how do you diagnose this? And I, I myself, um, that was around the time I was working with um, a friend of mine, Sarah Price Hancock, who's been in the community like the ECG community, community survivor community forever. One of the most knowledgeable people about ECT injury. Um, one of the most severely injured ECT people in the world. Um, but most, most not one of the most knowledgeable. It's gone head to head with the FDA. You know, writing them letters, addressing you know, trying to get them to address all the safety issues, the, the lack of you know good trials. Anyway, and I'm jumping around, but <laughs> sure. help me. What was I going? But help me get back to where I was. Um, I was kind of so you find you find this uh, doctor. He sounds like he's oh, finally yes. acknowledged Thank you. that you have ECT, and, and so he, is he the one that allows you to finally come down on the cervical gradually? Well, no. So I specifically went to him saying I want to get off these meds now. And, and what were you on? Because I know this was a couple of years ago. What, what's what was the the cocktail at the time? Uh, the cocktail that time. So that time I was having so much 
so many horrible headaches, pain, muscle spasms um, that I was also taking at this point. I'd gone to um, a pain specialist who had me on added like gabapentin or phenadrine citrate. I had multiple, uh, I had a couple different um, muscle relaxers and the gabapentin plus all my psych meds, which at that time, gosh, what was it? Seroquel, Prozac, Amitriptyline, Ambien, Xanax. Uh, how many is that? We got seven. I think there was something. That was seven. Any might have been one more, more but, but, but uh, at least seven. There might have been something else thrown in there, too. Um, and okay. so I go to him saying, look, I want to get off all these meds. I had already done a little my own kind of tweaking of some things because at one point that psychiatrist had me on high doses high doses of Prozac and amitriptyline and I think I was actually starting to develop serotonin syndrome unaware but I was feeling really really sick and I had gone to the pharmacy to pick up my meds and, and they're like tripping over to the microphone to get to the window and the pharmacist's like do you have serotonin? Are you developing it? And I'm like well I don't really and he's like she's got you on way too high dose of amitriptyline and and Prozac, yeah. and, and I'm like, oh, gosh. So anyway, by that point, I had dropped my med. I was already kind of shimming some stuff down. So I come to this guy saying, look, I, I don't think I should have been on these meds. This is the story. I had horrible childhood trauma. This, you know, And then I get in the system and it's retry. And he's like, yeah, you know, let's get you off. Now, he really knows nothing. He knows nothing. He thinks but he I does. But he said some really, like- really ignorant things about about the meds from the get go. And I knew, okay, I'm going to be doing this on my own. So So I go in and I tell them what to prescribe. I need you to prescribe this dose and this liquid. This is what I'm doing. And is this from like surviving antidepressants? Were you like plugged in with like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would look at Mark Horowitz's work. I would look at, you know, gather things online and basically I just figured out how to do it super slowly. And you know, the 10, no more than 10% kind of thing um, of your previous dose. But at this point, I, I went in not knowing a whole lot, but knowing I needed to do it slowly. But over that period of time, I'm, I'm doing more and more research and getting a better understanding about how to do it. He was at that point, we were still cutting, you know, like reducing dosage of pills because I was still high enough up that they could prescribe that, you know, and just reduce. And then maybe some of them I'd cut in half. Um, but he said some really, you know ignorant things like, oh, you're on the lowest dose of Prozac, you can just discontinue. And I'm like, mm, yeah. he said, because it has a long half-life. And I said, well, no, I said, it has nothing to do with half-life. It has to do with how long it takes your brain to, you know, the neurons, Real everything to, to get yeah. used to, you know, and I'm so like teaching him every, every point when I'm trying to teach him and I'm trying to explain but, but things was, to him. Cool with that he he said, and at like... one point he said, the meds can't trigger the same symptoms you're teaching. And I'm just like, aren't teaching, sorry, the, the same symptoms you're treating. And I'm just like, so every time I'm just like, okay, okay. He wants to help me. He's trying, he's talking spoon fed pharma crap. We're like, this is what he knows. Right. But he's willing to help me. This is the best I got. Really, really great guy. That's actually the best that most people get. You know, if you, if you're seeing mm -hmm. like a local doctor and really what I tell people is like, that's good enough. Like if you have someone that's at least willing to work with you and he's not going to just like impose his will, you can yeah. work with that. And, and yeah. so, I mean, I, I know he's not perfect, but it sounds like you actually found like a decent doctor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He cares. He, he understands the impact of trauma. He acknowledges yeah. his, he hates the APA, which I'm like, <laughs> how many yeah. psychiatrists hate the APA? You know, like, he thinks they're rotten, you know? So yeah, this is about as good as it gets. I mean, there's so few psychiatrists in the world who are trained on proper med tapering. So I'm not going to hold that against him. He's willing to help me. He's trying. I'm bringing in articles, you know? Oh, and so I'll go back to the, the, the brain injury. So, you know, I, like I said, I, right. Things kind of jump all over, <laughs> get a little jumbled in my head. So Sarah Price Hancock and I were, were, going to meet with a senator about legislation about ECT. I was wanting to get it banned. We, Hey, let's maybe we need to say suspension until we can investigate ECT practices and um, have proper clinical trials. Is this what really you sent me? That. Cause I watched your testimony and I watched Chris Dubley's as well. Was that all part of that congressional hearing? Or? So that was different. So I had, yeah. I had 
basically written a senator about some things happening in the mental health system. One of his legislative staff got back with me. And so over a period of about six months, he and I could communicate back and forth. I would send him articles, John Reed, I mean, all kinds of research on, on ECT injury, on brain injury, all this stuff. And he's like, look, I think this is super important. I, I, I think this is great. I'm going to get you this meeting with the senator. So he and I are commuting back and forth for months, you know, about all the issues surrounding ECT, what the FDA has done wrong, because apparently Braun hates the FDA, wants to revamp it, and da da da. Anyway, but he kept working, working, and he gets you this meeting. Finally, I get the meeting. I had happened to meet Sarah Price Hancock, who I had totally respected her work. Chance, our, our paths crossed, plus James. Um, James Hall. So we decided, I said, look, I have this meeting with the Senator. You don't know me, but hey, you know, you want to join me in this meeting to basically talk about legislation to, you know, ban or, you know, restrict mm-hmm. ECT or whatever. And she's like, well, yeah. So, but what's funny is she was focusing on the injury. I was focusing on sort of the human rights issues, the trauma, the, um, the economic issues. Cause now you've got all these people who are brain injured, can't function. They can't work. Like I, we're all trying to kind of create this presentation. James was focusing on the TMS injury. And as we're preparing for that, like, mm-hmm. and I think this kind of lined up with, with my meeting with my psychiatrist asking, and I said, Sarah, everything, all these health issues I've been experiencing all this time are like totally brain injury symptoms. She's like, duh, chill, yeah. So I go, like I'm making phone calls. Like I started calling like brain injury clinics and, you know, all these treatment centers saying, hey, you know, I, I want to have an assessment and get treatment from da, da, da. And they're like, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Let's get you signed up now. How'd you get your brain injury? And I said, ECT. And they're just like, we can't help you. And it was just like over and over and over. So many places. I can't even count many places. They just turned me down. No, you know, ECP doesn't cause brain injury. But that's one of those things, right? Like there's nothing you can do about it because it's as if it's, it's like having repeat traumatic brain injuries. It's, it's almost, I know it's, it's not exactly the same, but I I put it in the same camp as like, almost like football players when they have so many concussions, it eventually becomes like, you know, a long lasting, enduring state. And, and maybe there's very slow, gradual recovery, but it can really, I mean, yeah, it, it's brain damage. Yeah. But the thing is the medical community doesn't acknowledge it. I had been, t- I had yeah. asked two neurologists and I think this was before it really clicked, but maybe I was cussed on it, started to try to theorize, right. Cause I had run the gamut of doctors and specialists and tests trying to figure out what's wrong with me. A whole slew of neurological, cognitive memory, a whole slew of things right trying to get answers i so i had two different neurologists and i said could this possibly any of this stuff have been from the ect and they're like no 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 it's therapeutic it couldn't be for, and i'm like you realize you know they do okay, run so then, uh, no electricity for you and do some seizures and you're well, the, and so in their mind yeah it's therapeutic doctors, doctors learn about these things from what they hear and what they usually hear is it's fine but if you actually go into the academic literature and i'm talking like the mainstream academic literature it is recognized Uh that there are long-term cognitive consequences for ect in some people and that's not like a secret like but the thing is they'll recognize what's funny and i I used to have debates with psychiatrists and all these kols and on twitter and they insisted well yeah it, it causes cognitive issues but it's not brain injury you know and i'm like what is it okay so the person has all the symptoms of brain injury but you're claiming it's not brain injury because now you're doing mris and cts that don't actually show that type of damage you can't say (laughs) and i had had multiple i had multiple brain scans yeah, yeah, but they they, they they always like to change the words. They go, oh, we can't call the antidepressant withdrawal sin- syndrome. We can't call it withdrawal. We have to call it a discontinuation syndrome. You know, yeah. we can call it co- you know enduring cognitive impairment, but we can't call it like a brain injury. It's, yeah. it's, it's just this like spin on it, uh, which is so stupid. But I do want to ask yeah. you so. Uh-huh. From when you started then to where you are now, where are you with like with with the medications? How many have you stopped? How many are you still kind of going with? What what's the the update in terms of the progress that you've made? Because I mean, two years is a decent amount of time, but uh, I mean, sometimes it can take like ten years to unwind like the number of meds is what I've seen. Yeah, I'm down to two medications and very low doses of both of those. 
Um, so that's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, it's, yeah. Really it's been a, what, what, a rough road, and I it still I don't know still feels like the end is an insight in some ways, and in some ways it's yeah. like wow, I've come so far, but I know like those last bits can just kind of trail out forever. <laughs> yeah, well, you don't want it to get any worse, and so you do it properly. And and what are the last two that you're on? Say what? And what were the last two medications that you're, you're wrapping up your type? Oh, on? um, Lamictal and Prozac. Lamictal and Prozac. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, you know, I can, I can tell that you're not on a lot because when I talk to you, your face is so full of like life, you know, and you laugh <laughs> and, and all, all of these things. And I always think it would be it's interesting. Makeup. To kind of, it's makeup. It's just. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always think it'd be interesting to talk to your husband sometimes as well to get the before and after because one of the things that I notice the most when you start to taper someone off like maybe five drugs is, oh my God, it's like they they become so much more expressive. You know, there's just this kind of like reappearance of uh full range of uh, different uh, emotions in their face and, and, and things like that, which is. It's really like interesting you say that. Thing. Yeah. Cause I, I had a friend who didn't know me before all the drugging. She met me when I'm like on my max drugs. Right. And then when I started weaning off, she said to me, Jill, you're like a different person. She said, you know, I always loved you. You're always super sweet. She said, but sometimes I would look at you and just be like, something's not clicking there. Like your kids would do something that I thought needed addressed and you would just kind of be like, not there, you know, and just kind of, and she said, you're so vibrant. You can have these rich, intelligent conversations before, you know, you might be just kind of like, you know, but I used to, in a party, I would literally just sit there and watch everybody else talk because it's like my, it was like a chemical Mm -hmm. lobotomy. I couldn't engage. I couldn't, you know, and now, yeah, and now people are like, God, you won't shut up. You have an opinion about everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, how much is that just maturing and me just being fed up with all this, yeah. you know, probably combination. But, um, yeah, definitely a transformation. Yeah. And, and tell, me, tell me this. How much, um, how much weight did you lose um, from uh, since you, you came off the antipsychotic? So what's really interesting is it didn't just fall off me the way I hoped it would, because I think maybe I had so much ingrained, you know, so many habits ingrained. And when you're that obese, you don't just start running down the road. And what's interesting, I lost a little, but this is something, and I think a lot of this was brain injury, is that post-concussion syndrome and all this. And looking back over my medical records, I actually have been reporting these symptoms for years. But past few years, I literally have been, I lost 70 pounds from nausea. 70 pounds. I was chronically nauseous, dizzy, um, low blood pressure. Um, nobody loses. Yeah, and and I'm going was before from, you were withdrawing. This was on the meds, like you were losing weight? This is before I started withdrawing. This is before okay. I... Before I started any withdrawals, so several years ago, and I'm going from doctor to doctor saying, I don't understand. I am intensely nauseous constantly. I am dizzy. My vision's blurry. My blood pressure's low. I'm having heart issues. I'm having these twitches and these fat, all these, all these things that, you know, when you look at the electrical injury literature, the brain injury. So back to, are we doing okay in time? Are we? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So. So here I'm calling all these brain injury clinics, you know, getting turned down. I'm desperate. I'm calling my insurance. You know, can you help me? I I think I'm brain injury. I don't know where to go. And anyway, there was this brain injury clinic. I had emailed them, filled out sort of all this online form, and I got the ding letter. Well, apparently I look and I'm like, oh, they already gave me a ding letter. I didn't even remember. I think in my panic, I'm filling out so much stuff I had already. I ended up calling them up. Hmm? What, what's the letter called? I missed that. Oh, a ding. Sorry, I called it a ding letter. Let me explain. I meant the letter saying, sorry, we can't help you. <laughs> okay. And yeah. I just, I saw this phone number on there and I called him up. You know, I'm looking at the email and I call him up and I'm just in tears. And I said, I don't understand. I have, because I'm looking on your website. I have all the, the you know, post-concussion syndrome. I've got all this stuff. Like, why can't you help me? And I'm just desperate. I'm in tears. And she looked up and she said, oh, your brain injuries from ECT. She said, there are no tra- treatments for that. You know, there's nothing. Yeah. So she ended up emailing one of the doctors 
I don't know if it's the one. Well, I got two two of the dings. I think two different doctors had evaluated and said, no, we can't help you. I ended up, she said, let me email her. And I'm literally, you know, spent an hour on the phone with this poor lady. She's like the office manager. She emails me and the doctor ended up saying, okay, but tell her we can't make any guarantees, right? We, there's no, there's no established treatments for this. We fully acknowledge that seizures and electricity are harmful, that it can cause brain injury, but there are no established treatments. There's no, we're on uncharted territory here. And I said, I just need an answer. I need to know whether or not you can treat me. I need to know, do I have a brain injury? What's going on with me? I have been desperately begging doctors for years. I need answers. What's happening with my body? What's happening? You know? Sure. So I make this trip to Utah. I don't know how far it is from you, but, <laughs> um, and they do the brain scan. They do all these assessments. I mean, they're checking your timing, your balance, your rhythm, your, your vision, sure. your hearing, your sound mapping. Uh, you know, there's, it's very, very comprehensive. It's uh, two, maybe two or three days of assessments plus the, the, the scan, an fMRI scan. And this is the thing I had had multiple, um, MRIs and they're like, no, it looks fine. The fMRI scan, I should have I should have actually sent you that. It's they what they were that? flabbergasted. They're like Jill, we okay. were shocked at <laughs> the, oh, the severity okay. of this injury you've lived with all these years. But yeah, when I got the results, I literally wept tears of joy. Not yeah. because I was injured, but because I had answers now and I understood why my life was so hard well, and it validated tell, tell, tell me this, though. what they Is did to me. That like that like fMRI can pick up uh, brain injury from ECT. Have you seen this with other people who get other results from these fMRI scans? Um, so I think again, it's in one sense it's kind of uncharted. Not that I've heard some other people scattered kind of here and there. I don't think it's kind of infiltrated the literature yet because there's still a lot they don't want to say it's brain injury. So it's not like we got a bunch of psychiatrists doing fMRI scans on ECT patients to see, right? So, but they say, Jill, you know, we're specialists in brain injury. You have an injured brain. And here I hadn't been in sports. I didn't have concussions. Like I didn't do heavy sure. drugs, you know, like there was nothing. It, and she t- took the history of, okay, what was your functioning before? What happened? You know, have you been functioning since? I mean, they said it's obvious. And she told, so I started out with a Zoom interview before I even flew out there. And she said, Jill, you know, Everything you're reporting are classic brain injury symptoms. Well, you know, and I said, okay, okay but clinic, I want to just scan. In case anyone listening is interested in doing something like this, what's the clinic? Um, it's Cognitive FX in, in uh, Provo. Is it Provo? Yeah, Provo, Utah. And okay. this is the first time in my life where I felt like a human being dignity respect they believe you there's no gaslighting there's no belittling no treating you like you're ill you know they're validating because everybody who shows up there you know like concussion post concussion syndrome there's so many people who are going to doctor 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 trying to make sense of all these symptoms why can't i sleep why am i dizzy why am i nauseous why is my blood pressure doing weird things why you know why do i sweat why can't i regulate my body temperature why so the the fmri in case people who don't know it, it is picking up on neurovascular coupling which basically how they explained it to me was when you have brain injury there's areas of your brain um that are not getting the pre- proper signaling and proper blood flow. So it's kind of routing around. It tries to find other ways to do things and they tend to be way less efficient. So that's why you get extremely tired. That's why, you know, everything and, and slows do down on an fMRI because it's real time. You know, it's not just like a, you know, a, uh, a moment in time, they can actually, I, I, don't, I don't know, do they, do they see how the neurons are like firing when they, when you're yes, doing different Yes, so while you're in the scan, and, and I forget, yeah. it's either like hundreds of thousands of pictures it's taking of your brain and it's picking up yeah. the blood flow and the signaling of the neurons. So it's not looking at the structure, it's looking at the functioning, but they can see what areas of the brain are functioning. And basically when you look at, I wish I had that chart. I mean, I was like in the red zone, like green zone. There's like green, yellow, orange, red. I mean, some areas of my brain functioning were like all the way over in red, like in the most critical areas. And a lot of it was right here, (laughs) prefrontal cortex, frontal lobe, most damaged, which makes sense. I had bilateral ACT, you know. Um, So they were just astounded. What did you say? 
so because usually yeah. my router or they, they don't start with that one. Maybe they were doing that back in because I'm I'm used to it kind of being like this, but this one seems to be more cognitively devastating, and that's yeah. Pretty well known as well. I mean, yeah, you're shooting it <laughs> straight straight you know, through the points two right lobes. between there, yeah. and so yeah. so it was it was astounding to them. You know, they said it was one of the worst brain injuries they've. And, you know, of course, this is all with your skull intact. This isn't, you know, somebody bashed me in with a hammer or something. This is all intact skull. But they and they deal with, um, you know, post-concussion syndrome. They've con- they have athletes that are coming in. They, you know, and they said it was one of the worst they had seen. And they were absolutely astounded how I've made it through the past, you know, 20-some years of my life with this brain injury with no treatment, no acknowledgement. Wait, so, so tell me this, though. What do you do? Like, like what, what did they tell you after they diagnose this because I was kind of pessimistic about treatment. Did this give them any ideas about how they might help you recover? Yeah. So I actually was there, um, two weeks. Um, well they do like five days of treatment on the weekend off and five more days. Um, you know, and I think there were a lot of confounding factors that, um, they, they made absolutely no promises. They said, Jill, you know, this is uncharted territory. We're not going to make any promises about, your treatment about the outcomes, you know, cause this is a little, a little different, you know, it's an electrical brain injury. It's not quite the same as like sports, you know, concussions. We're going to use what we know about brain injury and do our best to treat you. So, um, it was grueling. It was absolutely grueling, but they were so supportive. They paced you. Um, basically a lot of it has to do with trying to get blood to certain areas of the brain with regulating your nervous system to help control some of the symptoms and, you know, to kind of help with a lot of the symptoms. Um, I think and is, that, is that like through like cognitive exercises or, or like how, how do you, it's all you kinds that? of stuff. They really, a lot of it has to do with combining multiple sensory things at the same time. So you might be on like something balancing while you're also saying something out loud while touching the hand and answering this question. So it's, it, okay. some of it has to do with like you're doing thing with timing while you're answering questions and there's like a metronome and they, they, they kind of have some cool tech they've developed. And um, it, the, the changes in my brain scan were profound. The director of the clinic on the last day when she saw my final scan, she's literally like doing this dance. She's like, yeah, I saw your skin. I was doing this dance of joy. And they're like, they were absolutely thrilled. But so I was think, it was it for real? Like, did you act? Did you recover? Like, did you feel like that 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 helped you? Like, in a noticeable way? So, so this is the deal. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't as miraculous as I hoped, but there are a lot of confounding factors. But what was really interesting is while I was there, I remembered the vacation my husband and I took that had been de- completely deleted. I had absolutely no memories of this vacation completely gone. I would see pictures. I was clueless. And I, I'm like, you know, it was getting near the end. The second brain scan showed a lot of changes. And I'm like, I'm just going to sit down. And I like started remembering all these details. And I'm like, you know, am I just kind of making some stuff up? Right. Started asking my husband. He's like, I don't know. Ask a caller brothers. We'd gone to see his brother-in-law. I started asking him all this stuff. I'm like, did you pick us up in a truck? Did we drive down this dumpy, like bumpy road to get to this cabin? And I, like I had all these very, very detailed things. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So whatever did it like cl- cleared up some gunk in my brain that I was at least able to access those memories of that trip that had been completely erased, you know, or inaccessible because of whatever had kind of been mixed up in my mm-hmm. brain all those years. So that was really kind of cool for me. But the problem is like they coming home, I had all this sort of this aftercare, like, cause it's, it's basically all based on neuroplasticity, right? They're trying to work with the brain's neuroplasticity to, to get it to heal as much as possible and reroute and, um, you know, yeah. so, so anyway, but I come home and here I had taken some time off grad school and I, I struggled with like intense fatigue. And I think I was running on a lot of adrenaline while I was there and I got home and I had, it was like weeks behind in my schooling, in grad school, which I'm already, you know, barely keeping up with, you know, really hard time. They had given me some extra time to try to recuperate after. So I ended up being like six weeks behind. I'm totally overwhelmed. I had crashed like physically when I got back, I was so exhausted. I completely crashed for like a month, just like emotionally, physically. Uh, you know, I think 
sort of this culmination of all these years of trying to get answer and it was amazing. But then, you know, oh, yeah. physically it was so demanding cognitively. And then I come home and I have all these stresses and I'm still going through withdrawal and I'm not sleeping because of withdrawal and everything just, I didn't do the follow up. I, I, my life right now, I'm still dealing with so much pain and so much, so many things and other health issues that I've just kind of, it wasn't the miracle cure, but at least I now understand what I'm dealing with and I have workarounds and, and I'm hoping once I get through withdrawal and I deal with some other health issues that I can re-engage in some of those therapies and maybe make some more progress. But at the same time, Probably. there's a little bit different about ACT injury. You know, we've got the electroporation, you know, some, some things that may be different from the type of brain injury they normally deal with. So I don't really know. Yeah. And I mean, if, I, th I think coming off Lamica as well, and and to a, and and maybe even Prozac. I mean, it's hard to kind of know how those drugs behave when you have a pre-existing brain injury as well. You know, is it possible mm -hmm. that they're having more cognitive effects? Um, that, I mean, both of them can cause cognitive effects on their own. You know, in, in healthy people, but I always worry with a damaged nervous system whether you, you have greater effects, and so. I mean, honestly, with the trajectory that things are heading with you and just and all of those things, I think there's multiple, mul you know, multiple reasons to think that things will just get better. You know, that's kind of what I hear in the story, just based on what you've told me. Yeah, I mean, definitely better in some ways, but still a lot of struggles, a lot of, um, you know, having a, a psych diagnosis in your records and trying to get any sort of medical care is virtually impossible you know you get ghastly you get dismissed you get every physical issue you try to go into a doctor and explain electrical injury and like they don't even write it in your chart it goes over their head they are not trained in electrical injury most doctors don't even understand the long-term effects of concussions they think oh you bumped your head you got over it you know no, you wouldn't still yeah. be having trouble all these years later and so when every doctor appointment you go in and you're literally trying to educate doctors about brain injury electrical injury seizures you know like i shouldn't have to be the one trying to educate them. and of course they're getting offended because who are you to tell me i'm the doctor and da, 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 da. <laughs> um well hopefully you don't have to deal with psychiatrists anymore after you come off your meds and so that'll yeah. be that'll be well yeah like that, that'll be great but even doctors yeah. themselves you know regular doctors when you're going yeah. in for a bunch of neurological issues and you're trying to explain to them oh and like oh and well and i i quite positive I had a heart attack during my ECT, which because asystole and bradycardia are common in ECT, that's, we've got documented where ECT practitioners are saying, you know, this is a common problem. And during looking back, this was a couple of years ago, I was looking at my records because I, I ended up getting my records and I noticed during my first ECT that there was, that they had a charge for pulmonary services. And I'm like, call up Sarah. And I'm like, are pulmonary services like standard? Because it made it seemed odd that it was just the first one. She's like, mm, no. I ended up calling the anesthesia company because the, the hospital like contracted with this outside group yeah. to do it. And I called them and I'm like trying to talk to the office manager. What's pulmonary services? Da da da. She's like, oh, I don't you know. She didn't really know. She ended up having this one of their anesthesiologists call me, and we ended up having this text conversation because this phone wasn't working. And basically, it boiled down to. Yeah, they're not, you know, it's not a standard part of, and that, and I basically was saying, could I have had a major cardiopulmonary event? And he kind of was skirting around the issue. He's like, oh, well, it could, blah, blah, blah. But basically, and then he was like, why are you asking? What's this about? Sure. And I said, well, you know, I'm trying to understand what happened to me because, you know, I've been living with a disability since my ECT and I was just diagnosed with brain injury. And they said, you know, my injury was also consistent with like a hypoxic or anoxic brain injury. Okay. And they got real evasive and they're like, okay, go contact the hospital. Bye. You know, sure. <laughs> you know, quickly got off the line. Um, <laughs> so I know. What, what, what a dumpster fire. I mean, the whole thing. Oh, and then I had an EKG, sorry, I'm interrupting here, but I had an EKG <sighs> that shows that I had a, a heart attack, a, a septal infarct at, at some point in the past. So, yeah. so <laughs> I'm not I'm right about time. I have to run to an appointment, so we're going to have to wrap up. Oh, okay, now. okay. Um, first, thank you so much for sharing your story. I think it's 
really, really helpful, um, one for me to learn, but also for other people who are going through something similar, just to see, hear how it happens, because I, I actually don't think your story is um, that uncommon for, for a lot of the stories about how these things happen, you know, multiple meds, meds not working, treatment resistant depression, and then ECT. That To me, that seems to be the most common pathway where the, these injuries happen, and so yeah, it was, it was great to hear. Do you have any final thoughts that you wanted to add before we wrap for the day? Um, I think, I think one thing for me since that time, I had some other, another friend go there who was dealing with similar symptoms. She was also diagnosed with brain injury. And again, somebody who was extremely high functioning, prolific career, making lots of money, basically has not been able to work or function since ECT. And of course, oh, it's your depression, blah, 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 even though she was depressed, you know, and functioning before all this. So for her to get her injury confirmed too, but what, what, I think that what's most striking for me is the fact that I think so many people with ECT brain injury are living with this injury and aren't aren't even aware of it. Like they they may be heard, yeah, you know, they said I may have some memory, short-term memory and cognitive issues, but they're not, so many doctors and so many people are not aware of what electrical injury looks like and what brain injury looks like, especially the long-term effects. And so I think there are probably a lot of people suffering with brain electrical injury from ECT are completely unaware. You know, they don't know why, you know, all the things that I was kind of listening before, why am I having all these problems? Completely unaware. Their doctors are unaware, you know, and it's sad to me that they're living with that injury unaware that it was that, you know, um, and I, that's what I would like to bring awareness to people. You know, if you're still struggling years later and you have all these kind of odd neurological symptoms, things that are all consistent with post-concussion syndrome, having that injury acknowledged and understanding what a brain injury is, how it affects you, how you need to adjust your life, how you need compassion for yourself. Other people in your life need to understand you're not stupid. You're not lazy. You're not crazy. You're living with a brain injury. And the doctors gave it to you and they're lying about it. <laughs> so that's kind yeah. of, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, really well said. And, um, and they've um, been doing it for 84 years and they won't acknowledge it. You know, they won't, they're never going to admit, you know, the old psychiatrist admitted it, you know, that, Hey, these people, when they have less brain and function, they seem a little better. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> when, just, the damage is secure. That's what they like used to say about ECP. Show. <laughs> yeah, it's an absolute horror show. Well, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you again. Thank yeah. you very much.